Niccolo was Italian royalty. He was embraced by the king. He was in all the right meetings. He was part of the decision tree for what made Italy happen in the 1500s. But then, as it happens, there was a regime change. And an entire new leadership team came in. And they bounced Niccolo. They banned him from the city of Florence. So much so that he lost all his money, he lost all his pride, he lost all his status, and he was banned to the outskirts of the city as a peasant, as a farmer. And in his farmer days, he decides the best way to fight back is to write. And so during the day he would farm, try to make a living, but at night, by candlelight, he would dress in his former formal government robes and he would write and he would write and he would write. And in 1515, he publishes The Prince, a manifesto of how to hang on in transfers of power. Today, we would call this Machiavellian. It's Niccolo Machiavelli who writes The Prince. And as disgusting as we might find some of these tactics, they included things like kill all the children of the old king, destroy the will of the entire family. Now, maybe we've progressed in 500 years in terms of organizational power in at least our tactics, but maybe not. My name's Mike Riga. I'm a managing partner with the Ecliptic Consulting Group. Welcome to Groundbreak 2020. As we move through this presentation, this is about organizational power, how to use it, how to gather it, and how to keep it. Machiavelli has some interesting teachings for us, and you will see some of them blended into this presentation, although I'll warn you where maybe areas where you might want to hold back on some of the Machiavellian type tactics. First, it's about adaptability. And I'm going to share with you four main components on how to do this and do it well. Carved into the very stone of one of the United States most prominent, prominent science museums is a quote that says, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but it is the one most adaptable to change. And underneath it says Charles Darwin. The problem is Charles Darwin never said that. He never wrote it. He never uttered those words. In fact, that was written by a professor of management and philosophy at the University of Louisiana, Louisiana State University, sorry, LSU. And in that, Leon Magasin captures some of the components of adaptability. And it's one of the things that Machiavelli could not do is adapt. When you have power struggles, when you have power change, adaptability becomes king. And I'm going to show you some of those skill sets on how to be adaptable as power switches and power changes to help you survive and thrive in organizations and deploy your own power. Now, Dr. Sally Fuller at University of South Florida, the MUMA School of Management, has developed what she calls a power map. And it, it is all things that you can reverse engineer to understand how power is deployed and used, and maybe most importantly, the effects of power. In front of you, in the leadership power map, all along the left-hand side, you have, in the yellow box, you have the sources of power. Where does this stuff come from? Is it legitimate? And what we mean by that is, are, are you at a certain level of the organization? Are you a management level? Or are you a principal level? Or are you a CEO level C-suite person? Do you have legitimate power as one of your sources? Do you deploy and can you use reward power in terms, many of you are parents, reward power is clean your room or mow the grass or do this and you will get this reward. Um, maybe good grades leads to something. This is the deploy the tactic of reward power, sources of these power. You have the ability to give rewards. 
So you have a source of power called reward, reward power. The next one down, there's an F next to it. And the next one down after that, there's an S. This reminds me of these two people and the story of Frank and Susan. These are very different leaders, both effective, but relatively short-term versus long-term. Frank deploys what we call coercive power. He takes over an organization and he's preparing it for sale. So many times when an organization is sold, it's not particularly nice to the employees of that particular company. Think of Niccolo Machiavelli as the change in power comes. And the first thing Frank decides he needs to do is start to micromanage the process. So he goes off to all the offices and he starts looking at spreadsheets and starts to tell people, look, this is our direction. You're either on board or you're not. If you're not on board, you're going to be decommissioned as a person here. You might even lose your role, your job. You might even be tossed out of the firm. But if you're on board and you're loyal to what I need to do, then fine. He coerces the force. Next down is Susan. Susan takes over a massive organization in the billions of dollars. And she decides, wait a second, maybe I should learn some things about this organization. And she goes to talk to the people. She really, really communicates with the organization, gets to know who is where, where are the sources within that organization that have deep knowledge of the organization, the marketplace, the arena in which they operate. And over the next six or seven months, she becomes revered as a leader. That's called referent power. And I'll show you when we get to tactics, the next box over what happens. And finally, that green, that light green box, the results, the reactions to this. You could also in the yellow box have expert power. In other words, you have some kind of, you're an SME in some particular area. You're the absolute wisest person in this particular area, your, your experience, your education, whatever. Expert is another source of power. And lastly, information, which is different than expert. In information, we're talking about a relatively short amount of time. You have found out about this. You understand where this client is going. You understand where this particular project is going. That's information power. These are the major sources. Now, how you deploy them is in tactics. But what's cool about this power map is you can reverse engineer it. You can look at the reactions of your organization, your team, your firm, and back it up and say, where did we go right and where did we go wrong? Next under tactics, ingratiation is, I don't know, you take your team to lunch, um, you pick them up for work, um, you're the person that brings in coffee and things in the morning, you're ingratiating yourself to others. This works with neighbors, this works with kids, it certainly works with family members. Next is persuasion, which is a strong, I'm strongly urging to use persuasion, influence. This isn't a negative connotation. This is a strong, make a cogent business argument for things. They will follow you if you're persuasive, which is different than exchange. And exchange is this for that. It's it's, it's, it's a transactional relationship, if you will. If you do this for me, I will do this for you. I have the reward. I have the money. I have the bonus dollars. I have the ability to give you time off. Whatever that is, we're exchanging, which is different than persuasion. Next is threats. And this was the tool that Frank used in his coercion. He was coercing, coercing a certain behavior and then used threats to back it up. And last is coalition building. This is what Susan built. When you have enough political cachet in an organization, you have built a coalition that can be really powerful politically. Those are the tactics used in a power map. Next, under that red arrow is your target has a certain dependency. For example, two people, maybe one is 50 and one is 30. The 50 year old, save their money, they're independently wealthy, they don't necessarily need this job, but they like it. And you come to them and say, hey, if you don't do this, um, slightly um, off center, let's say ethically uh, um, particular thing, then you're gonna, this is what's gonna happen to you. 
Now, the 50-year-old who's independently wealthy might say, mm, I don't think so. I, I'm not dependent on this role. I'm not dependent on this income. I'm not going to do that. But the 30-year-old, maybe a new family, maybe student debt is built up or whatever the case is, they have a deeper dependency. And you can say, you can watch how these things will affect these people based on their dependency. So this isn't a straight across map. The targets matter. And dependency plays a key role right between tactics and your reactions or their reactions. Only three reactions to this. First is resistance. And resistance is when many times in organizational change, there will be a reluctance, a resistance. Let's wait and see. I don't want to necessarily do that. I want to change. I don't want to learn. Whatever that is, it's resistance. And you can go backwards in time and say, wait a second, what's causing the resistance? Was I threatened into something? You're likely going to have resistance. Think of back when your parents used these kinds of things to get you to cut the grass or whatever it is you were supposed to do. You were resistant and maybe they used threats and maybe they deployed coercion. The next one is compliance. And in compliance, as I define it is, we'll do it, but just at the base level, we're not really committed to this, but we'll do it. Somebody wants me to do it. What you're after in leadership and what you're after in power is commitment. And commitment is that feeling that no matter if that particular supervisor or person is around, you're going to do it anyway because you're committed to it. This is intrinsic motivation. These are the reactions. So what happens? Frank deploys coercive power. He uses threats in exchange to deploy. He gets a tremendous amount of resistance and sometimes he gets compliance. That firm was sold 18 months later at a fire sale. Most of the big hitters left the firm. The talent streamed out of that company. Susan, on the other hand, used referent power and some other sources. And sure, she did some exchange, but she built a coalition. She deployed her power much different. Now, Susan's gone from that role, but the firm still continues to grow and grow and grow. Why? Because she has turned that firm into a truly self-intrinsic, motivated, commitment-oriented firm. And that's the difference when you deploy this different power. It's how to keep it. It's how to deploy it. So people say, okay, great. But what are those adaptive behaviors? What, what, what exactly am I supposed to do? Well, for those of you who are donkey owners out there, and I was one of those lucky kids who got to grow up with a donkey. Dad was a little bit different. So I, I had a donkey and they're wonderful animals and they're on your slide here in front of you. And donkeys have a really interesting way about them. They, they sometimes want to go where you want to go and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, they make it known. They basically just stop. And your people are exactly the same. So one of the adaptive behaviors you need to understand is this whole concept of positions and interests. This is Dr. William Urey's research out of Harvard Business School. Um, he wrote several best-selling books, Getting Past No, Getting to Yes. This is similar concepts throughout this entire process, as well as Stephen Covey and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Very similar kind of approaches because it's human behavior and human behavior tends to be relatively similar through the ages. So it says this, hey, when someone gives you a position like a donkey and they don't want to go there like a donkey, they will stop. They will freeze up. And what they're telling you many times is this is what I want or what I don't want. And our natural behavior is to tell them what we want, the opposing position. And then we get into a death spiral called positional bargaining. We tell them why their position is terrible and stupid and why you can't possibly hold that position because my position must be right. And they're going to take the opposing position and dig in much like that donkey will stiffen up its front legs and start to drop its backside away. They are digging in. And we have all kinds of sayings in the English language that support this. Things like stick to your guns, hold your ground. All of these things are embodied in this concept. And I'm suggesting that is not adaptive behavior. That is 
fight and flight behavior. Instead, move towards interests. And interests say, why is it that you want that? I, I may understand or I may not, but I need to understand what is the interest underlying that position. So when somebody says, there's no way I'm moving that team on site on Tuesday, you could say, position, you have to do it on Tuesday. That's what the client says. And I'm suggesting, hang on, you're about to lock that donkey up. That is not being adaptive. It's not leading you towards the kind of power map tools that make long-term success. And at some point, you're gonna use something like coercion or threat. <laughs> if you don't wanna come in on Saturday, then don't even bother coming to work on Sunday kind of thing. That's not gonna work long-term. Instead, when you hear those positions, think interests and say, you know what, let me, let me understand where you're coming from. Talk to me about why we can't get that team out there on that particular day. Uncover their interests. And if you get to that magical place where your interests align, then how and when and what gets done matters less. Now, this is sort of a magical scenario, and it's not always going to be the case. But if your default switch is coercion, if your default switch is being frank, you are slowly eroding your organizational power. And I'm suggesting you slowly build up the power with other types of uh, types and tactics that you use and deploy this power. And this is one of them, that adaptive component. Now, talk about ad adaptation. It's not that long ago when uh, there used to be something we'd pull up on our cars if somebody wanted to get a hold of us or we needed to get a hold of them. And we would put, I don't know, change into this metal box and we'd pull this cord into our car and we'd dial the number. They were pay phones. I don't even know those exist anymore. But in 20 years, roughly, that's gone and we have hyper connectivity in the world. So much so that we have had to adapt to collaborating as a population, not just in sort of small teams, but I'm talking about cross-functional collaboration in a world that's hyper-connected. You're always available. And so much so that this little statistic just blows my mind. And these, these numbers are a few years old, so it's probably bigger. But on your slide, it says there's in cell phones globally, 7 billion cell phones, which is about one per person on the planet. But only four and a half billion people have access to working toilets. So I don't know what that says about being a human being, but this connectivity is so deeply important to us. The problem is we haven't adapted to it very much. We haven't come up with the business skills to make ourselves more adaptable, more effective in a hyper-connected world. So what are some of those skills? What are some of those collaboration skills? First, it's adaptation. Next, it's collaboration. And on your slide, it talks about these success tools. And three very distinct ones jump out and should be at the top of your list as you deploy this power. First, when you're hyper-connected, when you're virtual like this, you need to engage stakeholders at a different level. And I'm not suggesting that we get all cozy with them and friendly and those types of things. I, I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the level of communication can't just be business. When you're face-to-face, -face, it's often not just, here's the business we're talking about and let's go. But something happens when you're virtual on the phone on these uh, virtual meetings. And that is, you jump right into business. And I'm suggesting the opposite. I'm suggesting you engage those stakeholders at a different level. Are there pictures of their kids behind them? Are there something that you can dig in and learn a little bit more about their life? And most people will sort of give you those cues about their kids going to soccer camp or whatever the case is. Pick that stuff up, gather that information, put it into your contacts, your CRM software, something a little bit different about those people. Because likability is such a powerful motivator when you're trying to influence. If I've remembered your kids, your job history, whatever the case, something about you, 
the likelihood that I can influence you goes sky high. But every time I talk to you, I need something from you, or I only get at you on the phone when there's a problem. My influence level drops like a rock. So stop it. Use this tiny little tool to supercharge your effectiveness. Secondly, Machiavelli was a scribe. He was perhaps one of the most powerful scribes of our existence. I'm suggesting, especially in these hyper-connected environments, that you be the scribe. Not like a note taker, but I'm talking about the scribe. You're putting bullet points down for the meeting. You're capturing the main components of the meeting. Why are we doing this? Because you as the scribe have the ability to recap and steer the conversation. It is a very soft but yet unbelievably persuasive way to deploy this tactic. And it sounds like this. The meeting's been going on 20, 25 minutes. And you say, hang on a second, just, uh, just for a second. I, I kind of want to go past uh, um, what we've accomplished so far and what we've agreed to. And you go down and you list the bullet points. If there are any terrible ideas that you say, oh, that was ridiculous. I'm never going to mention that. Then don't mention it. If somebody thinks it's really important, they'll bring you back. But you see what you've done. You've shaped the message. You've persuaded the group. You've reorganized the meeting. And you said, this is what we've agreed to. This is where we're headed. This is what we're going to do next time. Scribes have power. Next. And compliments. <laughs> compliments are a hilarious area of scientific research. You would think, just sort of intuitively, that if you compliment somebody too much, it would start to um, be fake. It would, it would start to not have the same kind of punch that maybe if you didn't constantly compliment, except that's not what the research should suggest. The research strongly suggests that there is no upper limit to compliments. So without being ridiculous, the suggestion is simple. When you're pulling away from these meetings, when you're wrapping things up, when you're at the end of a project, you tell them, hey, great job team. I, I, I really appreciate the leadership. I appreciate the work effort. You guys compliment the team. It's a small little gift that you can give them, but it drives ingratiation. It drives one of the main tactics in this power. Next political acumen and people bristle with this one it, it people say oh i don't i don't i don't i don't play politics I, I i don't do that not what i'm suggesting in fact jeff pfeffer wrote an entire book around power a stanford um, phd and he studied organizations for 40 years and basically the quote comes back to a carl week thing university of michigan that says this organizations do not make decisions based on logic. They make decisions based on politics, internal organizational politics. Now, could that be the reading of the market? Could that be a, a particular move towards more profitability? Sure, but according to these two deeply respected researchers, it's all about, or much of it is politically driven. So how do you participate in politics without quote unquote playing politics? Because I strongly believe not being part of that game is not an issue. You have two choices, participate or have games played of, in the political realm on you. It's you're either in it or you're under it. So I'm suggesting to your own ethics, make sure that you have these things buttoned up politically. That's it. First, what is the current narrative about you? Not, oh, she's a nice person or he's a great, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the business narrative. Do people say things like, you're a really, they're a really hard worker or she's brilliant or, um, He's never missed a meeting, you know, those types of things, or is the narrative more sketchy about you? You want to uncover what is the narrative about you. And it's rare that people ask that question. So where do you find that? You find that with your 
deepest friends in the organization. Ask them that question over beer, over coffee, whatever the case is. Find out what that narrative is about you and you make sure you are the author of that narrative. Don't let some false narrative go out about you that you're not on board with. You drive the narrative. Political acumen. Next, regardless of who you're dealing with, most people and organizations have some endearing quality, something. They're great communicators. They are good with people. Their team loves them. Clients love them. They're always on time. They know the, the, the latest in, in the industry standards. Whatever that thing is, search and find the strengths in people and advocate for them. Tell other people about their strengths. Now, what are you doing? You're tagging in to something Robert Cialdini said was reciprocity. Reciprocity is this power in the universe that I do for you and you'll do for me. Not right away. Not right away. It doesn't work that way. But eventually, that buildup of reciprocity and that need to fulfill reciprocity is there. Find the strengths in people and advocate their strengths. Next, absent talk. Absent talk is what is being said about you or what are you saying about others when they're not around? And you got to be careful here because for many of us, the common thing to do is sort of say, mm, you know, they're not all that great or this. You know what? Many times that makes us feel better about our place in the organization. Dead opposite. I'm suggesting you strongly push a positive narrative about others when they're not there. And again, much like reciprocity, what this will do is build up a well so that eventually people will say excellent things about you. Maybe they already do when you're not there. And that is so much more powerful, that hallway talk. When you're not there, that is what you want. It's having an army of people that are advocating for you nonstop. Absent talk is part of political acumen. The last component in power is all about leveraging relationships. And again, people say leveraging relationships, geez. You know, don't I have relationships because these people are good for me and I'm good? Yes, yes. However, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how is it that I can use the relationships that I've gone after? I've, I've, I've networked, I've built these relationships. So now what do I do with them? Well, simple things like, hey, send me uh, um, uh, an article that was particularly in my area. I thought of you and, and, and when I read this, send it. It just tells that person, I'm thinking of you. When you're on the phone with somebody and there's organizational change, you can say things like, hey, what's, what's changed for you and your team? What, what's going on there? It tells them I care about you differently than just the organization. Next, leveraging relationships. Everybody has some kind of specialty knowledge in something and you can use them and say, hey, would you mind talking to my team? I've got a team meeting coming up in a week and it would really be cool if you can come on board for 10 minutes and talk to us about X, whatever X is. It builds value into the relationship. And lastly, when you ask for help, there's a strong correlation between that and likability. Hey, I'm dealing with this. I wonder if you can help me. These are the magic components of deploying power in an organization. Adaptability, virtual power collaboration, political acumen, and leveraging relationships. Unbelievable, simple tactics, but you need awareness, you need some behavioral change. You need some other people to participate this. Leadership is tough with nobody to lead. I'm Mike Riga with the Ecliptic Consulting Group. These are the kinds of things that we do for organizations like yours. So whether you're a shell and core person, whether you're doing interiors, it doesn't matter where you are in the organization. With big organizations, small organizations, you are dealing with these types of things in your organization. We do all kinds of professional development, leadership development, coaching. Reach out to us. The number is there on your screen. 
Have an amazing Groundbreak 2020. Thank you.